Here to announce our final breakout session of the afternoon, I am pleased to bring to the stage Samir Anand, a director with BAE Systems. Samir? Thank you. Uh, it's my pleasure to announce, uh, uh, to introduce the panel. Uh, Gunjan Bagla is a former president of Pan IIT alumni. He is author of Doing Business in the 21st Century India, published by Hatchet, and writes about India for the Harvard Business Review. His company, Amrit Incorporated, drives USA India business with clients across diverse industries such as life sciences, consumer products, defense, and high tech. Companies from Boeing, Clorox, Medtronic, Roche, to early stage startups have benefit from his, benefited from his expertise. Gunjan is a graduate of IIT Kanpur in mechanics and in mechanical engineering. Um, today you've heard a lot about artificial intelligence. Okay, now this panel is going to be about real intelligence. <laughs> okay, uh, you also heard uh, Vinod Khosla in the morning say that uh, most experts are wrong and they are wrong most of the time. Okay. And I think that's, and I've heard him say that before, and it's usually because many experts are looking at spreadsheets and trends and extrapolating from that. I can tell you that each of the experts here is not going to deliver spreadsheet insights, but wisdom <laughs> from what they have learned over the years, and we are talking primarily about India and the future of India, not so much the past, but really India in the present and going forward into the future, okay? I encourage you to send your questions on the app. If you keep the questions short, then we may ask them and I may even identify you or ask you to stand if we choose your question. Uh, some, we only have 45 minutes. So there are some topics we've decided we don't want to cover, not because they are not relevant, but we just don't have time in 45 minutes. So don't ask us about Gaza. Don't ask us about Ukraine. Um, what else did we say was, uh, of, don't ask us about the Maldives, please. Okay, <laughs> if you've been following the recent news, okay. Uh, it's, no, we don't want to stay away from controversy. If you want to ask about Adani or Ambani, please go right ahead. And uh, this is going to be like a bull session on the IIT campus, sitting in the canteen or the quadrangle or whatever you had on your campus. But before I do that, let me identify how many people are here who are not IIT alumni. Okay, you are most welcome here, okay. And how many people are visiting from India? Okay, a few people here. Please participate and give us a critique on what we are going to bring up. Uh, we have one panelist from India. Uh, Jajit Bhattacharya, we have three from the US, and if we were trying to meet the DEI requirements of diversity, equity, and inclusion, I think our panel is the absolute best. Okay, we have the token white person, we have the token <laughs> woman, we have the token person, you know, a, a, a pro-government Bengali, and a guy named Modi who wrote a book called India is Broken. <laughs> okay, so we are covering the entire spectrum, okay? <laughs> so, ah, let me see. Uh, let me start with Rick Rosso. Rick is currently on the board of the U.S. India Business Council, which is part of the U.S. Chamber. He is the India Chair at the Center for Strategic and International Studies, someone I have known for almost 20 years. Um, and the chair for India Studies was formerly funded by one of the Wadhwani brothers, an IIT alumnus. Uh, it is now funded, I guess, by CSI itself. So, uh, you know, India is a federation, although sometimes people forget that, okay? Uh, and when you talk about the progress of India, it's really the progress happens in the states, regardless of what the federal government may be doing, and I don't know of anyone who tracks India's states more comprehensively than Rick and his team. And they put out a you know, newsletter and tweets about that. 
Since we have a limited amount of time, we are not going to talk about the states everyone hears about, you know, Gujarat, Maharashtra, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, whatever, you know, Yogi <laughs> state, my home state, UP. Tell us about a state that's doing well, Rick, that many in the audience may not know about or realize. Yeah. Please. Thanks for that, Gunjan. Um, yeah, states collectively are going to have a much bigger impact than the national government is in terms of what India's development trajectory looks like. There's not a lot of transparency in what states do for changing regulations and trying to improve or sometimes worsen the business environments, what that means for India's climate uh, commitments, what it means for India to actually take some of that manufacturing away from China that we all kind of hope will happen. So you're right, a lot of times, you know, Gujarat, which has done great work on reforming power grids, improving the business environment, Maharashtra, where, you know, between Mumbai and Pune, you've got two dynamic centers where a lot of investments happen. But the one dark horse that nobody really talks about right now, that personally I'd put a nickel on by saying that I think they're poised for takeoff is the state of Odisha. Not one that you normally hear about, but- What's the pronunciation now? Odisha. Odisha, right? We used to call it Orissa when we were young. So just to be clear. I'm trying. I'm yeah. still not on no, with you're, Bengaluru. You're and do not ask me to say Guru Graham in the audience. <laughs> um, but uh, Odisha, the reason I say that is because, you know, reliable access to electric power is one of, the, uh, one of the things that businesses need most urgently when they think about investing in India. Not the only, but it's one of those. And, uh, you know, you've had a couple of states like Gujarat and Haryana that have managed to reform the state-run DISCOM to a pretty effective way. But most states don't have the political capabilities to do that. Odisha has done an experiment with very few people know about. It's the only state in India that has actually privatized the entire electricity distribution system. Tata Power now owns all four discounts, majority stake. And three years on, versus the first time they tried it 30 years ago, it's going extremely well. So they haven't fixed everything, but access to electricity and the fact that you have the longest serving chief minister, so you've got relative stability of policy, are a couple of good things. So, you asked me to touch on a state that not as many people mention. Uh, Odisha is one I'd put a nickel on. Thanks. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Rick. So, uh, Tanvi, you and I have been on panels together. Tanvi is a senior fellow at the Brookings Institution, also here in Washington, D.C., a graduate of Delhi University, Lady Sri Ram College, if I remember right. Um, for those of you who are on Twitter, X, I guess I should call it now, uh, <laughs> please. Uh, Make sure you follow Rick and Tanvi, and I think, Jajit, you are also on Twitter, right? Yes, I am. Yeah. Yes. Uh, Ashok? I am also. You are on Twitter, too? I couldn't find I you. I am on Twitter. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. All right. Um, but the funnest tweets I ever read are Tanvi's, <laughs> okay? And we'll get into that maybe later on. Uh, so uh, you wrote a book on the fateful triangle, talking about India, Russia, China, and we'll get into that. So today, Tanvi, India is a top five global economy, okay? But when I talk to my clients, my day job is helping American companies to understand India and better engage with India, do business in India. And when I talk to people in middle America, across the Midwest, across the South, regardless of the kind of company or the size, I often get the sense that they have no idea of the changes that have happened in India. Uh, the UK, France, Canada, Korea, Italy, Israel, Australia, all of those countries get far more attention in people's minds and in American media, whether you talk about the New York Times or Chicago Tribune or, God forbid, CNN. You know, India is barely mentioned you know, and hardly ever in a positive way. So what, from your perspective, what will it take to change that? I think one of the things that I will say is you've seen an increase in interest. And if you look at the countries, the two kinds of countries get attention usually. One is a set of countries where, which are seen as a threat. So, you know, you chi your Chinas and Russias, people will invest in understanding them because we worry about them. I think the others, the, you mentioned the number of countries. There are a few things they have in common. One, capabilities, that they're large economies, military powers, uh, second is presence in different ways. Uh, either they have a diaspora here, or for instance, uh, you have companies, their companies present here, or vice versa, that there are a lot of Americans in these countries, American companies, American citizens. But I think the other aspect, all of the countries you mentioned are US allies, so it's behavior pattern as well, those who partner with us. 
And so it's, to some extent, it's natural that these countries get more attention. I think as you've seen these three things for India change, uh, one, capabilities, it's grown economically as a military power, as a nuclear power, one would say. Uh, you've seen capabilities grow, you've seen attention grow. If you see uh, presence, whether in terms of the diaspora or American companies interested in India, even if it's not as much as it used to be for China, for instance, nonetheless, you've seen uh, more attention. And then finally, as India has started being willing to partner with the U.S. and the U.S. government has shown interest, you've seen increased uh, attention. So, you know, if you, Rick and I look back often, it was really, I think, around the mid-2000s, you saw even in D.C., at think tanks, et cetera, you started to see uh, increase. Having said that, I do think on each of these fronts, you asked, you know, how do you get more attention? One, I'm not sure sometimes you want attention from the news <laughs> media because it's usually when something bad is happening in the world. But um, the other thing is, I think, how do you enable? One is things that India does for itself, which is, how, you know, if you have more uh, attractive uh, economic policy, et cetera, you know, even tourism, you'll get people who will pay attention to it. And that will be natural. Uh, Rick, Rick talked about this a, a lot in his own work. Uh, but I think there are, uh, there are other things that, for example, a group like this could do to enable that. Uh, every time one of you thinks about complaining about the Western media, what the West thinks, I want you to stop. And I want you to think about a, a more proactive way that you can either fund the uh, study, you know, I know IIT alumni often does chairs. Well, why aren't you funding chairs here at universities for India studies? Fund fellowships, fund study abroad programs, fund internships, whether in your companies that look at India or uh, at companies in India. Uh, each of these countries that you mentioned have invested here through these kind of mechanisms to study their own countries. So I, I think you know it's Indian companies, it's American companies interested in India, uh, and it's the diaspora that really needs to start thinking about how do you actually f you know, fund that actual work? And I don't mean opinion, I mean research about the country uh, and contemporary uh, India. So I think that the, the community can play a role and companies uh, can play a role. Uh, one final thing I'll say is we talk a lot about people not understanding India. There are no chairs in US studies in India. So this is a two-way kind of lack of understanding. And I want to see an IIT chair, an IIT class of whatever chair in US studies in India in the next kind of 10, 20 years. That's, that's awesome. Thank you so much, Tanvi. So let me make it more specific to this conference here. We have some of the brightest minds, and not all just IITians, you know, we had head of the Carlyle Group here, we had the CEO of IBM, right? The Washington Post isn't here covering this event, right? Neither is the New York Times. Gunjun, I just told you stop. Every time you think about yeah. complaining about the Western media, <laughs> stop and move on and think about, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt, but just no, that, that's... That's cool, that's cool. We, we, we want diversity and we want controversy here. So Tanvi, on, from, on my own, just to give you some feedback, on my own, without any PR firm, I've got, managed to get myself in the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times and the Washington Post, okay? So I encourage those of you who are entrepreneurs to try this on your own. You don't have to spend big money, but get your name, get your company's name, get India, featured in those other than stories about Maharajas and monkeys. You know, there's a heck of a lot happening in India that, that we, can, we can cover through our collective efforts here. Um, so let me move to Jajit, who is a graduate of two IITs, my alma mater, Kanpur, and then IIT Delhi. Uh, Jajit is, uh, lives in Delhi and uh, runs the Center for Digital uh, Economic Policy. Am I saying it correct? CDEP. Uh, he's also an entrepreneur and involved in many other initiatives. So I have a challenging question for you, Yajit, uh, and I request a short answer to that. So India has millions of people working. In India, they say software, and I correct that. I say software services. They are renting labor by the hour or by the year or by the month, and people are writing code for others. Okay? We haven't really seen a flurry of Indian companies, Indian software product companies that are household names in the US. I'm talking about whether you think of SAP or you think of Snap or you think of, you know, other than service providers, yeah, TCS and Infosys and so on, but 
you know, there isn't a product that I can identify other than one company out of Chennai, Zoho. So they are a remarkable exception. So what will it take, you know, at the next IIT alumni conference, do you think we would have, you know, three companies that would be household names that produce software or digital products? Yeah, I think, Gunchan, these are one of those uh, holy grail questions. <laughs> and uh, I'm pretty sure everyone in this audience will have a view on it. So, and all of those views are correct because it's, it's a very complex issue. But let me step back a little bit and look at what's happening, not just in India, but globally. Um, how many products came out from the rest of the world outside of the Silicon Valley, outside of US? Um, if you look at Europe, again, about a $20 trillion economy, how many new products came out? It was Spotify and then Skype and um, what else do you remember? SAP. Yeah. So SAP was 30, 40 years back. I'm talking about the, the last 20, 30 years. Um, you've got China, which um, started coming out with products about 10 years back. And the companies which were formed in around 2000 started kicking off around 2007, 2008, like the Baidu's and the Tencent's and so on and so forth. And if you look at India, we are at, uh, from an economic perspective, at the same level that uh, China was in 2007, 2008. We have got roughly the same GDP now. So that's the trigger point where things will start happening. But that's just one factor. The economy is just one factor because look at Europe. It's much bigger uh, and it's still not producing too many products. Um, one of the key issues is the ecosystem, right? And what does the ecosystem mean? That uh, if you don't have the right set of um, players and stakeholders, you can't just create a product out of the, out of the blue, which, is, uh, which fits for the world's requirement. So let me take a, a real example of what happened in about 1813, 1814. There were two legislations that were passed in the British Parliament, and it's all there online for the British uh, parliamentary records, where they passed a legislation saying that um, Indian ships, um, which are below 350 tons, will not be allowed to fly between Britain and India. And uh, you can't have British flag on them, and if they carry goods, they'll be taxed extra. And why 350 tons? Because the British couldn't produce uh, the larger 1,000-ton ships, which India was good at. And basically, the shipwrights went to the king and said, look, you know, um, they got a better, uh, I can call it the TCO in today's language, a, a total cost of ownership. They're bigger, stronger, lower maintenance. So when your Royal Navy needs us, we won't be around because we'll be dead by then. So please do something. And the next year, they passed another law which, which stopped all Indian ships from operating in the transatlantic route, which was very uh, lucrative in those days because they would pick up slaves from West Africa, dump them in US, uh, pick up gold from US, dump it in UK, and then go back. So the ships were stopped, and therefore, both Surat and Bengal stopped producing all the ships. So when the iron ships came in, India was not there in the scene. So then for the next 100 years, there was no ecosystem. So you can't have the next set of innovation happening in void. So let me you interrupt you. Have when, the... when do you think it will happen? When will we see? So when, um, same as what China did in that sense, you know, the government intervention was needed, right? Let me take one more point around it because it's not a single dimension uh, issue. The issue is also about capital, right? Look at open AI, $13 billion pumped in, at the right time with the right yeah. set of people. I've got to push back at that. Software doesn't need a lot of capital. Need, well, products... Needs a laptop and a million dollars, and you can get it's, there. But it's, I appreciate your input. Let's move on to, yeah. to, to our friend Ashok at the other end here. Um, Ashok's book was published a few months ago, I think. Uh, it's called India is Broken, and he's written extensively on that subject. Uh, so I have a challenging question for you as well, Ashok. So if your name wasn't Ashok, and it was Narendra, and you were given the power that Narendra Modi has, what would you do? What are the top two or three things briefly that you would do to fix the India that you see as broken? Yeah, it's a very good question. And I have, uh, in fact, in my book, I do say that if I was Tsar of India for a day, and I could do only one thing, I would create a world-class mass education system. That is the central predictor of economic success and progress for the last 250 years. Go back to Adam Smith, 1776. Adam Smith is considered the prophet of free markets. 
Well, what does Adam Smith says? It is the obligation of the state to create a first class mass education system. Just note the word, mass. Mass means everybody. Today the data shows that 85% of Indian kids finishing school do not have what are called basic skills to participate in a global economy. So yes, we have some very fine people. I'm not denying that. But you want to make progress on a large scale. Look at China. We keep comparing ourselves with China. The same percentage for China is 15%. China has some of the world's most intensely good uh, educational institutions, right from primary school, secondary school, through the universities. There is no example in history of a successful nation without a proper, well-functioning education system. And if there was a second thing I could do, I would try work hard on gender equality. That's the other thing that, that history tells us. Adam Smith did not talk about gender equality, but since then we know that gender equality is, is crucial. Crucial both for the social purposes and for economic purposes. And we, are, we lack woefully in gender equality. So you don't have two of the basic foundations for long-term growth, mass education and gender equality. Thank you, thank you for bringing that up. Uh, in my travels to China, I, I did notice that when you go into a meeting, there are you know, significant number of women managers in the room. And uh, you know, with, while the top leadership of China is not gender equal, certainly in the middle, in the, cor in the corporations, they seem to be a much fairer distribution between men and women. So, uh, Tanvi, we were talking about that a little bit, uh, you know, as we were preparing for this. Uh, you know, here in the U.S., we have a woman in the White House, Kamala Harris. We have Nikki Haley, who got endorsed by the Koch brothers, and now with the, by Tim Draper. Uh, we have, uh, you know, number of uh, women in political uh, power here. We have women CEOs uh, in the West in, of Indian origin. Um, what do you think about the gender equality question in India and how it's, how, it, how is it evolving? I think, you know, if we're talking about gender equality, I would like to see more women amongst your keynote speakers at your next iteration <laughs> of your conference. So we can, we can talk about India, but also let's talk about uh, here. Um, I, I will say, you know, I would say the most successful to add to what Professor Modi said, when you look at public policy interventions around the world, the most impactful in, um, uh, kind of one factor that makes a difference, not just directly, but second, third order effects, is female literacy. And so education, yes, also especially making sure women are educated. But the second thing I think, uh, and I think this is something the Indian government is acknowledging, which is you cannot have, and Dr. Geeta Gopinath has said this as well, you cannot have a world-beating economy if you have the female workforce participation rate that India does right now, which has actually fallen and is lower than many countries around the world. It's just untenable. So to me, you have to have, and it's, it's, to some extent, it's a, 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 you know, public intervention through governments, but it has to be a broader societal effort. It has to be cultural to some extent, more comfort with having women in the workplace. We're seeing some interesting experiments. Uh, Apple, for instance, is through its kind of subsidiary uh, manufacturing facilities that are being set up, the Foxconns, et cetera. They are hiring mostly women in those factories. Uh, let's see if that's something that can be, you know, scaled beyond or not scaled up, but actually you see this at a broader level. So I think, I think this is a no-brainer. To me, what's also interesting is last election, 2019, there were as many women who voted as men did. And so I think you're just going to start to see politicians have to listen to women in a way that I think nobody asked what do women want? And hopefully that question will come to the fore, not just in this election, but in the future as well. Well, I do encourage you to send questions through the app and we'll get to them very soon. Um, but very quickly, uh, Jajit, do you have a 30 second uh, comment on gender 
equality or gender, you know, in, in you India? Know, it's, um, I mean, India and South Asia are pretty strange places because they were the first ones to have women heads of states. And for a long time, there was a history of women running the place. But when it comes to um, you know, running companies and running commerce, uh, they suddenly seem to disappear. We you know, obviously have a whole bunch of examples of this woman being the CEO of another company and so on and so forth. A lot of uh, unicorns being run by women. But you know, at the factory level, at the, you know, at the workforce level, exactly what she said, uh, women are missing. And uh, that's a mix of uh, gender infrastructure not being there. Um, education obviously is an issue, but a lot of um, you know, semi-educated men are also a part of the workforce, but where are the women? And uh, that's going to hold us back if we don't provide the supporting infrastructure, which is both at a, um, uh, at a city level as well as a family level. Both needs to come up to be able to get the women to start working. And if 50% of your workforce is not there, that's going to pull your GDP down. Thank you, thank you. Rick, do you track uh, gender equality or diversity at all at CSIS? Yeah, I'll just augment, you know, something that uh, Tanvi had said, right, which is it's everybody in this room's responsibility. I presume a lot of you mentor, a lot of men in the room mentor, who are the last five people that walk through your office for mentorship. Are they all men? If they were, you know, can you do more to seek out women that maybe you're looking to take that next step up and where your counsel and advice and leadership can actually help? So, you know, it is, uh, 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 you know, echoing Tanvi, it's a call to arms, I think, for people in the room here. It's not some esoteric thing to be talked about on stage. It's something that everybody in this room can take forward and hopefully do some good things on. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the uh, room is being very quiet. So let, let's bring up a fun topic. You know, my, my daughter got married two months ago. And we decided uh, that at the reception, we would only have alcohol of Indian origin. <laughs> so we had Indri whiskey, Amrut, and Rampur. We had Taj Mahal beer and Sula wines. And uh, all of the non-Indian people were quite thrilled with that selection. Some of the Indians wondered why we didn't have black label. Okay, so I think there's a mindset change that has to happen. Uh, but I'd love, for those of you who do drink, I'd love to get your take. I mean, India is the largest consumer of whiskey in the world. <laughs> now the largest producer, their whiskeys are winning all kinds of awards. Uh, but if you do drink, what is your favorite Indian drink? Tanvi, you want to start? Uh, I think some of the, in, uh, you mentioned the whiskeys, I think some of the Indian gins are very good. Uh, and my, the ones I like uh, quite a bit are Hapusa and uh, Stranger and Sons. All right. Rick, do you have a favorite? No, I'm not much of a scotch guy. I know the scotches have made a lot of progress, but I'm more of a bourbon guy when it comes to hard liquor. But Sula wines, uh, you find them more and more places, and I think uh, some of them are quite nice. So I'm a fan. If it's there at the table, I'll certainly take. Yeah. Okay. I, I don't drink much, and I don't have a view of uh, which is better or not. Uh, but if it gives uh, more jobs to the wineries in Pune, then I'll go for Sula. <laughs> 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 well, you know that uh, Grover and Sula, the two big wine players, I think Grover was started by a software entrepreneur of Indian origin who moved back from the U.S. to India yeah. and began by planting grapes and waiting for them to grow. So, yeah, there's uh, definitely activity. Ashok? Yeah. Oh, um, my mother used to make some very nice green tea, uh, green label tea, and that's my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> okay, okay. Can, can I just say one thing though? I, I do think beyond like, you know, what all of us like, this is, this is kind of a business issue as well in the sense that to me, what's been good to see in the, just the last few months is uh, this industry being seen as a industry and not just a cultural issue. So, you know, you're starting to see the government say, how can we increase exports, uh, get market access? But that also means then doing the reverse which is thinking of when you think about trade deals, and this is going to be a case with the UK-India free trade agreement, uh, you have to then give market access as well. And I think part of the thing is that the Indian uh, liquor industry should have the security to say that, yes, open up the market because people will still buy our stuff and we will get access to a, a global market. Um, but there's a lot that needs to be done within India to just have 
distribution and sales within the India, because I can tell you the two uh, things that I mentioned, for the longest time you couldn't get them in Delhi. It was easier to get them abroad than get them because they were growing, they were in Goa or Bangalore. Yeah, yeah. I think liquor distribution is a huge challenge in India still. Uh, it hasn't been affected by all the improvements in, in other aspects. Uh, but I saw that even Gujarat, which has you know, banned liquor for so long, and now at Gift City, you know, they are opening up the sale of alcohol. I remember when I first visited Baroda, all these IIT friends wanted to come see me right away. And I realized it wasn't anything they cared about, but as a US citizen, <laughs> I could buy the booze, uh, you know? So I got this false sense of being very popular there. You have to fill out the certificate saying you're a forsworn alcoholic yeah. uh, to be able to buy, but right. small thing. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think we need to talk about China if you're talking about India and the future. So, uh, of course, everyone knows now that Apple is making iPhones in India. Well, to be accurate, Apple's large Taiwanese vendors are assembling phones in India from components that come from all over the world. But the size of Apple being what it is, you know, the, that has created employment for 50,000 or more people in India and will probably go up to a quarter million soon. Uh, Value add in India, I imagine, on an iPhone is still like six or seven dollars of the total price of the iPhone. But it's, it's kind of made the rest of the US aware that India can be a manufacturing partner. I've been talking China plus one for 15 years, but finally you start seeing it in, you know, in mainstream media, in fact. Walmart has more than doubled its imports from India. And Ambassador Sandhu yesterday talked about the Hero bicycles being sold at Walmart stores now. Of course, Hero is the largest maker of bicycles in the world. It's about time <laughs> that their bikes made it to the US. So I'd love to get a quick take from each of you about, and let me again ask a more challenging question, you know. Sales are going up and so on, but first, let's go to the contrary point. How many of you here feel that US-India trade has gone up in the last few months? Raise your hands if the you- The US-India trade. Has it gone up, he's asking. Yeah. How many people feel that that is, that is true? Can you raise your hands, please? Okay. How many of you feel it's gone down? Anybody? I don't see any hands up. Rick, oh, you want to one. tell them? One? One hand, yeah. Okay. So you want to tell them the truth? Yeah, you, you've actually seen a bit of a downturn on U.S.-India goods trade, uh, about 6% over the last 12 months. And you've also seen, surprisingly, about a 25% drop of foreign direct investment into India. So you got a couple of uh, uh, announcements by Apple suppliers, and that makes such a splash that people kind of presume India's hitting the mark, that investment's coming in, particularly manufacturing. But the government of India's own numbers show that really that hasn't quite happened yet. So um, we just had, of course, uh, the US Trade Representative was just is actually in India right now. We resolved, or at least agreed to drop, a number of uh, WTO disputes. And you know, just on your point, uh, Gunjan, on, on, on the China question, um, you actually have seen, despite the fact we've had multiple U.S. administrations in a row that were not particularly pro-trade, um, and especially when we talk about investment by U.S. companies, we wanted it to come back home, they actually have made a pretty good separation when they talk about friendshoring to encourage investment into India, particularly in the sectors that are strategically important. So this is not soaps and shampoos and the basic stuff, which usually makes up the bulk of trade. But when we talk about the things we cannot let China dominate, semiconductors, quantum, 5G telecom, 6G telecom, things like that, you actually have seen the US government pretty active in trying to encourage US companies to consider India as the next best place to invest. So if you look back at the joint statement last summer when Prime Minister Modi was in Washington, DC, it's amazing to look at the number of times that US investments into India were actually congratulated. Because for a lot of years now, we try to downplay that. Um, just because we wanted to see those jobs come back. But India, a little bit like Apple with that reality distortion field they talked about with Steve Jobs, our general interest on bringing manufacturing back home, India's been able to warp that a little bit because if you're not going to be in China, India's a pretty good option. So they're trying hard. Thank you, Rick. Can, can I just me? add on quick, the quick on semiconductors? I'm, I'm sorry? Just on that point, China plus one, that ship has more or less sailed. Mm -hmm. It's going through RCEP, a lot, most of it, the plus one aspect. The fact that we are not in RCEP 
is a huge liability. Chinese are going into their own hinterlands, away from the coast. That is becoming a major export uh, center. And the Chinese are, expo are investing in Mexico and South America for the French shoring business. So at this point in time, the China plus one ship has sailed. We can keep sort of insisting that we will get some share of it. But as Rick just pointed out, the numbers are not looking in our favor at all. But ask yourself why? What, what do we have to offer? What does Vietnam have to offer? A world-class educated workforce on par with, on par with the uh, industrialized countries of the world, a superb infrastructure, part of a free trade agreement, which is also one of the world's freest trade agreements. And then you have Mexico. Mexico is now the largest player in, in, on the block. So I think we have to really be very careful in building up this hype about China plus one. And if I may just say on the semiconductors, in an earlier incarnation, I studied the semiconductor industry. And while it is in the US interest to try to limit China, China is already producing nanometer uh, wafer technology, or close to there. We are still talking about assembling chips, maybe. So we have to be very careful when we throw around the word semiconductors, because it ain't happening anytime soon. Yeah, I tend to agree with you on the semiconductor issue. I mean, my, my friend is running the Micron Initiative my classmate is running the Micron Initiative in Gujarat, and it's you know three billion dollars, but two billion dollars of that has come from India, you know. So they, they got Micron got a and very the sweet Foxconn deal. And Foxconn Vedanta's thing fell through. Well, that was a deal that could not have happened, you know. The, the two one people who didn't it, know how to make chips were going to get together and make chips. The one know? area that it has worked though is on uh, the production of uh, solar panels. Yes, because there the United States also this idea that. Indian voters do not care yet about climate change, but Indian politicians care about jobs. And the US Development Finance Corporation has now put in almost a billion dollars for two investments, one of which is already producing solar panels. So it is good to see that at least one of these strategically important areas, they're putting their money where their mouth is too. It's not just simply encouraging companies, hey, look at India, but actually putting some real money behind it. I think there are a couple of things here though, right? I think whether or not you want to frame it as China plus one, for India, just in terms of its own economy, needs this kind of investment, and not just from outside. Frankly, private sector in India needs to spend more, something the government has been trying to get them to do. Some of it is, let's see where this investment in infrastructure, et cetera, logistics, is this going to help? I think India needs to do more on the trade front, because I, I don't think that necessarily has to be RCEP. I think the RCEP, which is the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership, that ship has sailed for India because, not because the India is fighting the US battle on China, India is doing it for its own sake. At some point, India doesn't want to be dependent on ships from China for its own sake, not, to, not anything to do with the US. I think from the US side, one thing we know, India is whatever the US says, going to get into the chips business. The question is, do we want to help facilitate that? Uh, and be the partner that India actually looks to. It's not going to be one thing the US has helped convince India that you cannot go from zero to 100 overnight. But you have to start at kind of the low end first. India is going to do this because India has always believed historically, whether it was a Nehru government, a Indira Gandhi government, or this government, that it doesn't want to be dependent on outsiders. So it's going to do it. As for Things that are too late, look, I grew up in a transitioning India. I have no love lost for kind of, there's certain things I don't think India needs to do. But I see this debate about, is it manufacturing versus services? Is this versus that? India has to do all of the above, just in scale. Second, ecosystems will not get created overnight. So semiconductors, yes, it's not gonna happen overnight. But at some point you have to start somewhere. 
Uh, same thing, you could say, why is Apple going into, into India? It's just assembling. But today it's assembling. Hopefully they'll create an ecosystem as long as the Indian government and others have facilitating policies. And that eventually that'll be more than just, you know, putting that final screw in. Totally. So in my own experience at my company, we have found world-class manufacturing in the most unlikeliest places across India. Okay? And US private equity is buying up many of those companies. So there's a vibrant investment collaboration going on you know, with, uh, with the two countries. Uh, you know, Stephen Schwartzman famously said you know, his best investments today are in India, the head of Blackstone. Um, Advent International, which is, which is a private equity firm, is buying biotech companies in India and globalizing them. So it's happening across you know, many, many different industries. And when I take my clients to visit manufacturing facilities in India, sometimes they are absolutely blown away by the quality. You walk inside the factory, you can't tell that you are in India. You know, I've been to Bharat Forge in Pune. I've been to the largest plastic bottle maker in India. We walk inside there and it's absolutely world-class operations. You can't tell that you, know, you are not in Europe or, or, or the United States. Uh, Biotech is going by leaps and bounds, you know. So I was at the JP Morgan conference and most people there don't, didn't know this is the healthcare conference. Most American executives don't know and recognize that India is the largest vaccine maker in the world. Okay. Kunjan, let me take a quick anecdotal example of exactly yeah. what you're They're saying. They're telling us time is up, so you have right. the last no, Very seconds. quickly, so we were setting up a missile factory and the components started to be coming from Germany and, and, and other places. Pretty quickly, we realized that they were actually being produced in Coimbatore and so on, yes. going to Germany and then coming back. <laughs> so the, your point of things being um, you know, already there in place, it, it needs to be discovered and put together. Yeah. And um, you know, the, the logistics handicap used to be 14%. Yeah. The recent statistics shows it's now 8.5%, which is the same as most of the places in the world. So yeah. it's a marathon, and the bridge is getting uh, closer and closer. Absolutely. So two quick things. Uh, the speakers will be outside that door, so if you have one-on-one -on -one questions, most of us will be there to answer them. Uh, the organizers want me to ask one final question, which is if you were to sum up India in one word, okay, let's go with one word, not one phrase if you can. What word would you choose? And let's start with Ashok Modi. Hope. Hope, all right. India's time. Flexibility. Aspirational. I will go with energy. Energizing, I should say. Well, thank you, audience. You've been wonderful. Thank you, panelists, Sunday, Rick, Yajit, Ashok. And thanks to the organization for doing such a great job. So thank you, panelists, for a very energetic, hopeful, and stimulating conversation. Uh, just one more thing. Uh, Gunjan has two copies of his book, Doing Business in 21st Century India. So we're going to give it to the first two people who submitted questions. I know there were a lot of questions. We may or may not have gotten to these questions. But if George Koshi and Himanshu Shekhar can meet us outside the speaker's lounge, uh, we have a couple of copies of this book for you. Thank you. Thank you so much. All right, that's a wrap for all of our sessions for today. Um, we do have a meditation uh, session going on. If you, again, check your app or uh, the website for details there. And then we also have those campus sessions starting at 5.45 p.m. and going till 7.30 p.m. So again, check your agenda, uh, see which one you'd like to attend and make sure you don't miss it. For those of you who purchased a gala ticket with your conference registration, um, you'll have a G on your badge um, and that gala is this evening and uh, definitely promises to be a good time. So if you're going, please enjoy. For the rest of you, I hope you have a wonderful evening and look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning. Thanks so much.